Elections and other political processes are pivotal to the quality of a country's governance. Elections can either greatly advance or set back a country's long-term democratic development, as well as of U.S. foreign policy priorities. The most fundamental principle defining credible elections is that they must reflect the free expression of the will of the people. To achieve this, elections should be transparent, inclusive, and trusted by voters and those elected. There have been several questionable elections. In 1876, Republican Rutherford B. Hayes won against Democrat Samuel J. Tilden in an election marred by voter fraud and violence. But the 2020 election took it to a new level. Many things occurred that had never happened before, and many of them were illegal under the various state and U.S. federal voting laws. And we will examine the 2020 election and see just what the liberal media and weak Republicans were afraid of exposing. For four years, the liberal woke Marxist media and their handlers have tried to control the messages and suppress dissenting views that attack their preordained narrative. And in response to those who challenge their narrative, the Marxists have resorted to using lawfare, such as frivolous lawsuits, civil suits, and criminal racketeering charges, which have escalated to silence and potentially bankrupt those who dare to question election integrity. Now it is our turn. Why was there so much controversy surrounding the 2020 election? Are the claims of voter fraud credible? If so, how widespread was it? Who was involved? How deep is the corruption within the deep state? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, military veteran, historian, author, and welcome to this episode of Forgotten History. In 2020, Joe Biden said, We've built the most extensive voter fraud organization in history. The liberal media said it was a joke. Others say a Freudian slip. But many believe that he was confident in the plan the Democrats had put in place to steal the presidential election. We will let you decide. Due to the COVID-19 restrictions imposed upon businesses, churches, schools, and even private residences by various governors, it was decided that ballot drop boxes and mail-in ballots were the way to go. These methods were fraught with potential voting fraud, as many states did not require voter identification or even signature verification. In fact, radical progressive liberals do not want voter ID, and they openly say so, calling requiring IDs racist. But common sense proves that anyone who does not want legal voter ID and verification wants fraud just as they support Biden opening our border to bring illegal aliens into the country, hoping to eventually make them citizens and legal Democrat voters. Also, expect a lot of these illegals and multiple voting Americans, even the dead, to vote in the next election. Trump and others saw it coming in 2020. Starting in spring 2020, Trump began to sow doubts about the election, claiming that the election would be rigged, in favor of Democrats and that the expected widespread use of mail balloting would produce massive election fraud. He was quite accurate, as research has recently proved. Therefore, in July of 2020, Trump considered delaying the election, but in August, the House of Representatives voted for a $25 billion grant to the U.S. Postal Service for the expected increase in mail-in voting. Trump blocked that funding, saying he wanted to prevent any increase in voting by mail. According to the mainstream media, Trump repeatedly refused to say whether he would accept the results of the election and commit to a peaceful transition of power if he lost. What the media failed to also state was that Hillary Clinton refused to accept the results of the 2016 election, and she was not alone. Trump was concerned that certain states and certain blue districts, even in red states, were changing their election laws without going through their state legislatures, and were also doing very early voting by mail without any oversight. Additionally, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg paid out approximately $400 million to install ballot drop boxes in various unsecured locations, but these were not all monitored. These drop boxes were a major point of contention 
but the liberal explanation was not persuasive, Newsweek stated, Many entities have debunked the notion of widespread fraud, including an Associated Press investigation last year that found only 475 potential instances of cheating. Also, a New York Times project where reporters spoke to election officials in every state concluded last year that there was no evidence that fraud played a role in the outcome of the presidential race. A USA Today investigation in late 2020 concluded accusations of wrongdoing were unfounded or overblown. The Brennan Center for Justice noted that the nation's top intelligence and law enforcement agencies called the 2020 election secure, and the list goes on. That laughable statement by Newsweek flies in the face of reality. In producer Dinesh D'Souza's film, 2000 Mules, he provides conclusive proof of voter fraud that benefited Democrats in Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, New York, and Pennsylvania, all being highly contested states where the Democrats had to cheat to guarantee a win. And here's how they did it. In Pennsylvania, the Democrat Governor Tom Wolf and his Attorney General Josh Shapiro, another liberal, changed that state's voting laws by executive order allowing mail-in voting and very early voting without going through the required state legislature, violating both Pennsylvania and federal election laws. The state allowed not only unregulated drop boxes, but also mail-in ballots without a required date on the return envelope, and they had to be counted. There was no voter ID or signature verification required. More than 2.5 million Pennsylvanians voted by mail during 2020's presidential election, most of them Democrats, out of 6.9 million total votes. Some voted multiple times. In Pennsylvania, a statistical analysis conducted by the Trump campaign that matched voter rolls to public obituaries found what appears to be over 8,000 confirmed dead voters successfully casting mail-in ballots. There are other issues as well, and Sean Hannity had two postal workers who came on his TV show, one a truck driver, and neither man was affiliated with any political party. They explained how they drove a truck of signed ballots from Bethpage, New York, to Lancaster and then Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, on October 21st during early voting, to be counted again. Driver Jesse Morgan said he saw 24 Gaylords, or large cardboard containers of ballots, loaded into my trailer. These Gaylords contained plastic trays, I call them totes, but trays will work, of ballots stacked on top of each other. All the envelopes were the same size. I could see the envelopes had handwritten return addresses. I could even tell that one was marked registered mail. He had to wait for six hours in Lancaster and he was not allowed to offload the ballots. Then he was told to take the boxes to Harrisburg but when Morgan requested a receipt showing he arrived and waited for so long in order to get paid, he was refused. No paper trail. Other whistleblowers claimed that up to 288,000 ballots disappeared, another 100,000 were improperly backdated, and mail promoting President Trump was junk while mail for Biden was delivered. Their report concluded, Postal subcontractor Jesse Morgan on October 21st moved 144,000 to 288,000 completed mail-in ballots from Bethpage, New York to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where his trailer holding the ballots disappeared. So, Biden beat Trump by more than 80,000 votes in Pennsylvania, far less than the estimated 200 to 280,000 already cast ballots transported from New York, and Trump had won Pennsylvania solid in 2016. Pennsylvania received $35 million from CTCL and the Center for Election Innovation and Research to expand unsecured voting locations where Democratic support is prevalent according to the Foundation for Government Accountability. In Arizona, which threatened to go for Trump, A.G. LaFaro, the chairman of the Maricopa County GOP, has been drumming up controversy by implying he witnessed voter fraud when an activist for the group Citizens for a Better Arizona dropped off some voters' completed ballots at the Maricopa County Elections Headquarters, which has some right-wing blogs going nuts. He stated, I believe it's inconceivable, unacceptable, and should be illegal 
for groups to collect hundreds if not thousands of voters' ballots and return them to the elections offices or polling locations. And let's not forget the ballot parties that occurred where people gather in mass and give their unvoted ballots to operatives of organizations like Citizens for a Better Arizona so they can not only collect them, but vote them illegally. America used to be a nation of laws where one person had one vote. I'm sad to say, not anymore. The Secretary of State, the counties, and the state legislature passed some great election laws in 2013 that resulted in HB 2305, Lafauer writes. I know because I testified at several of the hearings. Why did the progressive socialist and militant groups cry after the laws were passed? Suppression and disenfranchisement of the Hispanic and minority voters at Al, so they could force the repeal of HB 2305 and continue their voter fraud activities. Also, according to Bill Carrico, Arizona couldn't complete their audit of 2020 results that involved chasing a trail of missing records, given that data was withheld by non-cooperative people to the extent of ignoring subpoenas. It took Arizona weeks to count these votes. The only reason it would take that long is if they had to create ballots to make up the imbalance that supported Trump. Florida, with a much larger population, counted all of its votes within 24 hours. Only liberal locations have trouble counting votes. In Atlanta, Georgia, which is part of Fulton County, attorney Rudy Giuliani and Team Trump presented a video in Atlanta on December 3, 2020, that shows ballots stuffing being done at the State Farm Center in Atlanta from 11 p.m. on November 3rd to 12.50 a.m. on November 4th, 2020. The election officials had all workers and watchers leave the State Farm Convention Center at approximately 10.30 p.m. on November 3rd claiming a broken water pipe. There was apparently no broken water pipe. Some election workers and officials remained after everybody else was kicked out. Ironically, the ones who remained were Democrats. Without any oversight to impede their progress, at approximately 11 p.m., these workers retrieved suitcases that had been concealed under a table. In the suitcases were ballots that they proceeded to put through Dominion counting machines. Of interest, the table with the suitcases had been placed in the counting room at approximately 8.30 a.m. on November 3rd, with a tablecloth used to conceal the suitcases. After about two hours of stuffing all of the ballots through the counting machines, the workers called it a night and went home. Of interest, Trump was leading in the count by over 100,000 votes until this happened. The next day, Biden had received all the votes throwing him over. The margin of victory in Georgia in 2020 was 11,779 votes. In Georgia, Underscoring the critical role any given category of election irregularities might play in determining the outcome, the estimated number of alleged deceased individuals, or ghost voters, casting votes almost exactly equals the Biden victory margin. A ghost voter is one who requests and submits a ballot under the name of a voter who no longer resides at the address where that voter was registered. These faulty counting machines were also used in the runoff for Senate in January 2021. In this article, voting machine vendor Dominion acknowledges their code was compromised in the 2020 elections and in a 2021 race as well. It should also be mentioned that many of those fraudulent ballots were not folded, meaning they were not mailed, and they did not come with envelopes, also proving not being mailed with no postmarks or dates. There was no signature verification either, and many were believed to be copies of the same ballot. Despite the lawsuits filed by Dominion over Giuliani's claim that the voting machines could be manipulated to alter votes, a revelation came forth published by the Gateway Pundit that would have blown liberal minds if the information had not been suppressed by a corrupt liberal judge and Secretary of State. On February 10, 2021, Trump called the state attorney general, Raffensperger, in Georgia to locate just over 13,700 votes, the margin of victory, knowing that thousands of ballots were in serious question. There were also concerns over the Dominion voting machines. In response, Georgia prosecutors opened a criminal investigation into Trump's efforts to subvert the election in Georgia. And now that politically motivated case is in serious jeopardy due to the illegal actions of Fulton County DA Fannie Willis. 
As reported by Jeff Holt in the Gateway Pundit on January 19, 2023, J. Alex Halderman demonstrated in court how Dominion machines are hacked and their tabulations were altered. It was also revealed that Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger had been hiding this report from the public for two years. University of Michigan professor of computer science and engineering J. Alex Halderman and security researcher and assistant professor at Auburn University Drew Stringle collaborated on the report, but they discovered many exploitable vulnerabilities in the Dominion Voting System's ImageCast X system. Halderman displayed the ability to hack a Dominion voting tabulator in court in Georgia on January 19, 2023, using only a writing pen. Far-left judge Amy Totenberg sealed and covered up the results of the investigation of Dominion voting machines in Georgia and sat on the report knowing full well Giuliani was being sued for telling the truth about the machines. The report confirmed what Trump and Giuliani asserted, that votes can be altered in the Dominion voting machines. In fact, the report revealed that the Dominion software is vulnerable and can easily be hacked. Georgia officials, as well as other liberal locations, refused to allow forensic examinations by independent investigators. Even the Trump-hating rhino Secretary of State Raffensperger hid this information from the public until forced to admit it in 2023. Now, I personally can't imagine why, but these people should be in jail. Across the swing states, corrupt judges and prosecutors and the media held the line after 2020 to make sure no one was allowed to question or examine the integrity of actual ballots, inspect the voting machines, look at voter registration rolls, confirm signatures and addresses, lest they might substantiate tens of thousands citizen reports of fraud. In fact, several people who voted Republican at the polls in person or mailed in ballots checked their votes online and saw that they were listed as never even voting. Others found that their votes had been flipped to Democrat and even better, several people complained that they received multiple mail-in ballots and several spoken to even confirmed that some of their dead relatives had voted, some voting Democrat for the first time. The challenges went to state and federal courts, but the cases were not heard, despite the liberal media claiming that the charges were defeated in court. This was because there had been no investigation conducted to provide evidence, and corrupt or lazy judges and prosecutors made sure no one was allowed to question or examine the integrity of actual ballots, lest a premature certification be reversed, because that would be embarrassing. Also from Bill Carrico, I also found it suspicious that a law allows ballots from a federal election, which is held every two years, to be destroyed two months prior to the next election. It was chasing the originators of that law that led me to the congressional record of 1960, where I found the law was passed by LBJ, JFK, and Nixon a few months before JFK narrowly defeated Nixon for the presidency. Michigan had its own issues, and like other Democrat locations, played games during the ballot counts. Independent and opposition observers were told to stand as far back as 50 feet from the tables due to COVID and therefore not able to see what the ballot counters were doing. Several precincts actually banned observers from entering the buildings, and one video showed the Democrat ballot counters and party officials covering the windows with brown paper to stop anyone from looking inside as ballots were counted. Postal subcontractor Nathan Peace was told by two separate postal workers on two separate occasions that the USPS in Wisconsin was gathering over 100,000 ballots on the morning of November 4th to backdate the ballots so that the ballots would be counted even if they arrived after the statutory deadline. Computer expert Gregory Stenstrom, a Pennsylvania witnessed a vendor of Dominion machines and the local election officials download and update counting machines in violation of election system protocol and the commingling of machine jump drives in violation of election protocols and rendering audits impossible without direct forensic access to the machines. Another whistleblower claimed that ballots were backdated by postal workers and in Traverse City, Michigan, Trump campaign mail was put in bins labeled undeliverable bulk business mail, while the same type of mail for Joe Biden was ordered to be delivered on time. The investigation by the Amistad Project uncovered potential flaws and fraud in ballots and voter registration of several states that have certified the election counts in favor of Biden. 
The group said that whistleblowers found that election officials in mostly Democratic areas manipulated ballots and campaign mail, potentially influencing the outcome. The whistleblower accounts released today detail the failure of election officials in blue jurisdictions to maintain ballot chain of custody, allowing for the potential infusion of fraudulent ballots. These accounts include photographs of individuals improperly accessing voting machines and a detailed eyewitness account of the breaking of sealed boxes of ballot jump drives and commingling of those jump drives with others, said the legal outfit. It added, the accounts also reveal multi-state illegal efforts by USPS workers to influence the election in at least three of six swing states. Details include potentially hundreds of thousands of completed absentee ballots being transported across three state lines and a trailer filled with ballots disappearing in Pennsylvania. This referred to Moore, who drove the trailer to Pennsylvania from New York. According to the deep state Marxists and their media platforms, Biden won the election on November 3rd, receiving 81.3 million votes, or 51.3%, to Trump's 74.2 million, or 46.8 percent, and 306 electoral college votes to Trump's 232. Their problem was that there were no reported errors in counting ballots that favored Trump. However, long before the election, the deep state Department of Justice, including the FBI as well as the IRS, were covering for the Biden crime family. Here is how they influenced the election. The following information is courtesy of Bill Carrico and Miranda Devine. On April 12, 2019, Hunter Biden dropped off his laptop at a repair shop in Wilmington, Delaware. The shop owner, Mac Isaac, confirmed with a signed receipt that Hunter Biden signed a repair authorization and dropped off an unbootable laptop, asking for its data to be recovered and saved on an external device. The criminal actions on that laptop were withheld from the American public for a full year during the campaigns and election. The Deep State Justice Department and FBI, as well as the treasonous 51 former intelligence heads, lied when they stated that it has all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation. Joe Biden denied the validity of the laptop, and he denied the allegations of illegally accepting foreign money to the American public during the debate with Trump. Surveys show that between 20 to 25 percent of Democrat voters would not have voted for Biden had they known then what they know now. That survey does not include the opinions of the dead who voted, who were unavailable for comment. Getting back to the aftermath of the election, citing Bill Carrico, covering up a rigged election requires preventing actual ballots from being examined because fake ballots are relatively easy to spot. For example, election auditors could examine ballots to determine not just if they came from a copier, but if they were printed on a different stock of paper or if they were on legitimate paper but weren't marked by ink from a voter's hand, or if they haven't been folded and placed in an absentee ballot envelope for mailing. Finding any one of these is proof of fraud. Regarding the events in Fulton County, Georgia, I again present Bill Carrico, who stated, Evidence of fraud can be easily gathered, which is why corrupt judges would not allow ballots to be examined. I attended a Fulton County, Georgia hearing online where plaintiffs were requesting permission to examine a portion of the ballots. Early on, Judge Brian Amaro stated he would consider having copies of the ballots made for the plaintiffs to examine. This is insane. Logically, it's the equivalent of hindering Treasury agents by only allowing them to examine photocopies of counterfeit money rather than original counterfeit bills. The judge agreed to provide plaintiffs with scanned images of 147,000 mail-in ballots for inspection, while the official ballots remained in Fulton's custody. In response to that ruling, the state prosecutors hired an outside firm to challenge the ruling, which delayed access further. I quit attending the hearings at that point. I recently searched for articles and found one where Judge Amario had granted a second request to unseal the ballots but only to let Fulton County employees make 600 DPI copies while the plaintiff's experts watched. All of this was political theater orchestrated by a judge who artfully slow walked this case for months, stringing the plaintiffs and their well-intentioned donors along. Sadly, the failure rate of pursuing election fraud claims remains near 
This judge drew the proceeding out for 10 months before he ruled against the plaintiffs on October 2021 without allowing a single ballot to be examined. Naturally, the plaintiffs appealed. It was granted. And it was hard to miss the disdain in the Atlanta Constitution and Journal headline. The Georgia Court of Appeals on Thursday revived a lawsuit by election skeptics who want to search for fraudulent ballots from the 2020 presidential race, two and a half years after it was decided. Aguin, citing Bill Carrico, It's worth a closer look to see why the case was dismissed, considering that citizens were requested to look at the actual ballots, among which fraudulent ballots might be found. When the case was filed, there was no other place to look at that point. The judge controlled the evidence, and he refused access to it and said the people making the request had no standing to do so because they couldn't prove how it harmed them. This isn't an isolated case. This is the norm. Corrupt judges have maintained this ballot blockade for years, preventing anyone from getting near the ballots. Plus, their decisions are always rubber-stamped by the U.S. Supreme Court. Here is the link to the Superior Court of Fulton County's official document file for the dismissal, and here is a sample from its 14 pages, which gives a sense of how a judge can slow walk a simple request to look for fake ballots. See the original documents in the footnotes. They have been removed from these excerpts, which are taken from the first four pages. The court finds the plaintiffs have failed to allege a particular injury, thus they lack standing to bring claims, and the three respondents' motion to dismiss is granted. Petitioners alleged violations of their state constitutional equal protections and due process rights. In their initial petition, petitioners claimed that fraudulent ballots had been counted in the general election. In support, they offered affidavits from individuals who participated in the ballot counting process who averred that there were large numbers of absentee ballots that looked as if they had been marked by machine rather than by hand. Further, two of these individuals averred that, while other absentee ballots showed obvious use, there was at least one batch of absentee ballots that was pristine and printed on different paper stock. The fact that these ballots contained no creases or other indication of being folded to be put in envelopes and mailed out caused one individual to believe that there had been additional absentee ballots added in a fraudulent manner. Petitioners therefore sought the production of scanned ballot images and physical copies in every mail-in and absentee ballot that was counted, audited, and recounted in the November 3, 2020 general election in Fulton County. What happened next is telling and will be revealed. In part two, we will examine the court cases and expert testimony that proved that voter fraud occurred and how the liberal elites tried to cover it up with complicit Republican help. I want to thank one of our viewers, Bill Carrico, and to mention his memoir, Profiles in Deception, A Historical Reset, who supplied a lot of the information for this show from his own investigation, which supported and corroborated our own conclusions. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for watching today's episode of Forgotten History. If you like this episode, please consider becoming a channel member or joining our Patreon page. This would help us offset the ever-increasing cost of production. As always, please like, share, and comment. And if you have any show ideas, please contact us, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Until next time.